I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. Hang on. Okay, before I come on screen, I'm gonna ask you guys to just pretend like everything is normal. Like I don't have, I don't look any different from usual, okay? All right, and three, two, one. Hi guys, it's me, Little Karibo. Looking like an actual, uh, Little Karibo. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Wasn't that Yami Yugi guy supposed to take over reviewing GX for me? Well, let's just say his ego got a little too big for his magical leather britches, and he scarpered, leaving me in the lurch and in the Shadow Realm of all places. So obviously the only way for me to escape the Shadow Realm was to sign a pact with the Dark Lord Zork, giving him ownership of my physical body so that he could once again walk the Earth, and allowing me to return to the world of the living in the form of a dual spirit. And of course he picked a Karibo because... I guess the Dark Lord Zork has a sense of humour. Anyway, so long story short, I'm back and I'm adorable. Oh, and surprise bonus, they finally let me into Slifer Red because apparently anyone who resembles Jade and Yuki's haircut gets accepted automatically to the shittest house at Duel Academy. Can't wait to start chunking with Bumley. I mean, bunking with Chumley. Hopefully he doesn't mistake me for a pillow because that could get rough. So yes, now that I've escaped the Shadow Realm, I can finally begin doing the Dark Lord Zork's bidding. I mean, uh, go back to reviewing Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Totally without the Dark Lord's consent. It, it definitely is not his grand plan to destroy the world by subjecting you all to Yu-Gi-Oh! spin-off content. In case you're new to these videos, this is the series where I watch an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and recap what transpires, all whilst providing my jokey commentary about how crazy and out there Yu-Gi-Oh! tends to be. This isn't a review show, and you shouldn't take any of my jokes as genuine criticism or opinion, and you certainly shouldn't use any of my commentary as an actual critique of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Except for the part where I declare a blood feud with Bastion Misawa, that stuff is very real and I'm very serious about it. Attack point quantum mechanic. Fuck off. Anyway, with the prerequisite Bastion bashing out of the way, let's find out what's in store for us in episode 33 of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, entitled Field of Screams Part 3. Funnily enough, the movie Field of Dreams was originally going to be called Field of Screams, but then Bobcat Goldthwait dropped out at the last second and was replaced with Kevin Costner made a world of difference. Yes, previously on Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, the villainous Camula had turned Zane into a sort of plushy voodoo doll version of himself. No! Now how will he stand by the lighthouse and do not much of anything at all? You've robbed this show of its most fleshed out and layered character. All kidding aside, this is a big deal because as far as we know, Zane is the best duelist at the academy, leaving them with not much hope of overcoming Camula. After all, centuries of vampire folklore have taught us that the only way to defeat a vampire is through card games. Stake through the heart, crucifixes, aggressive application of garlic does not seem to be an option here. No, in the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe, Van Helsing was just a halfway competent poker player who just so happened to find himself facing legions of the undead more often than not. So as this episode begins, we see Chancellor Shepard taking responsibility for his actions, refusing to put children in harm's way, and deciding to face Camula himself. No, actually that's a lie, he's just looking out the window at a bunch of clouds. Probably a bit worried about those kids he sent to their likely demise, but mostly looking at clouds. We then see one of the seals protecting the sacred beasts magically opening, and Shepard comments to himself that two of the gates have now been unlocked. Then suddenly he gets a video call on his computer from... Baron Harkonnen from the Dune movie? God, I hope this all culminates with musical artists Sting in a cod piece. Your excellent duelists only excel at losing. Hey, that's not fair. They're also very good at finding egg witches. And sometimes tennis. Why don't you give up and surrender the five remaining keys now? You see, back before social media existed, the only way to get your fix of misery was to log on to Skype and get berated by an underwater mutant man. We all did it. Chancellor Shepard says that if he knows his students, they'll never give up, no matter the odds. I mean, after all, they've come to this island to be champions. Except for Chumley, he's mostly here to disappoint his father. But he'll be the champion of disappointing his father. Underwater Immortan Joe isn't done scoffing. My vampire is ready to feed again. <laughs> oh no, that means another kid's life is at risk. But hey, you go back to looking at clouds, Chancellor Shepard. It's, uh... I'm sure there's nothing more you could do. Jaden is tossing and turning in his sleep, and Alexis has the utmost concern for him. Jaden. 
Make it well. Wow, yeah, she really sold the concern there. When I receive a get well soon card in the mail, that's exactly what I hear in my head. Just a very exasperated... Get well. Like, come on, get well already, jeez. Alexis watches over her brother, who she doesn't tell to get well. Sheesh, hurry up. Atticus's medallion then starts to glow, and he begins to show signs of life. If only Zane were here to see this, he'd likely exhibit the one emotion he's capable of expressing. Back at Castle Camula, Cyrus and Chumley are dragging Professor Banner, insisting that he stand up to Camula. I mean, you're a Shadow Games expert! Yeah, not only that, you're the only one out here that's wearing garlic aftershave! Look, I'm all for putting garlic in everything, but... There is a limit, and you have crossed it, Yu-Gi-Oh GX. Also, you know Chumley only knows this because he attempted to eat Professor Banner's aftershave unsuccessfully. Or successfully. I don't know. I don't want to take credit away from Chumley. Professor Banner protests. Who will take care of my cat? Pharaoh has a very specific diet. Prah, that's right. Who will catch me freshwater salmon from the river if Professor Banner leaves? And who will drive me to Taco Bell at two in the morning after I party a little too hard with the catnip? Meow. Yes, there is a Taco Bell on Academy Island. It's been there the whole time. Don't take my word for it. Check the official school map. The whole group is surprised as Alexis shows up in a motorboat, announcing the cavalry has arrived. Oh sh! Alexis is finally gonna step up to the plate and realize her potential as both a character and a duelist. This is gonna be- We don't need Banner when we've got Jaden. <gasps> oh, and she's just there to hand the plot over to Jaden. Got it. Never mind, guys. False alarm, everybody. Jaden emerges from underneath a sheet on the boat. Not sure why Alexis had hidden him under that sheet, uh, presumably to downplay the disappointment of Jaden once again being the solution to the problem. The others protest, saying Jaden is still way too hurt to challenge Camula. But Jaden gestures to his medallion piece, which has now been joined by the other half that Atticus was wearing. It turns out back in the nurse's office, Atticus woke up and had an emotional reunion with his sister. And by emotional reunion, I mean he immediately started spouting exposition at her in a very bored fashion. You cannot defeat her like the others. But why not? She has a shadow charm that gives her the power to steal souls. Does it also have the power to steal acting talent? Because that seems to have happened here. Atticus explains that Camula used a shadow charm to take people's souls, and the only way to prevent her from doing it again is to use another shadow charm, referring to his medallion. Ah yes, the shadow charms. Not to be mistaken for the Millennium items. Very different. I mean, you've got a bunch of mystical items shared by duelists, each containing their own unique dark powers that add different stakes to card games. And then you've got the Shadow Charms. Seriously though, did the Shadow Riders ask their boss for Millennium Items and he told them they've got Millennium Items at home? Only for it to be these shitty knockoff items that cancel each other's powers out when they're used in tandem. Alexis says if they can stop her stealing souls, then they can duel Camula with all their might rather than just standing there scared. Look, just standing there is all the animation budget will allow for most Yu-Gi-Oh characters, so don't go getting your hopes up, okay? Alexis says they've now got their own Shadow Charm, compliments of Atticus. Cool. So we've got a magical artifact infused with dark powers, so of course we're going to give it to Jaden for safekeeping. The guy who literally slept through the entire defense against the dark arts class. Well, at least it's already broken, so he can't do that. Jaden leads the charge to Camula's castle and announces that he's here to take back his friend's souls. Which is weird, because the only souls taken are Crowler and Zane. But I guess there's no quick way to say, I'm here to take back the souls of the guys who either hate me or are entirely indifferent to me, depending on the episode you're watching. A flock of bats appears! Bat, 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 bat. Suddenly, Camula is there, prepared to duel, facing off against Jaden, much like in her duel with Zane. Jaden is quick to catchphrase at her. Alright, Camula, get your game on! And I mean on high, Camula! On high? What is this, baking instructions for getting your game on? Should I also spray my game with a thin layer of cooking oil before getting it on? Do I need to wait 30 minutes to swim after getting my game on? I've still got lots of questions. Cause when someone duels my pals and turns their souls into some dolls, it puts me in a bad mood! I also don't like Mondays, Camula! And dropping my toast butter side down really honks me off, Camula! Camula channels her inner Bakora. And let me me tell you something. I don't care. <laughs> That's good. Jaden activates polymerization to fuse elemental heroes Avion, Sparkman, and Bubbleman in order to summon elemental hero Tempest's crotch. That's a lot of crotch. Like his crotch span is even more impressive than his wingspan. Bastion <sighs> says Jaden is trying to end this duel quickly and that with a move like that, he might just do it. Only for Chaz to say, don't count Camula out just yet. <laughs> Counts. 
Yeah, I, I get it. You kiss, kiss vampires and uh, Sesame Street. Professor Banner agrees, saying that they've seen how strong her cards can be, especially Illusion Gate. Sorry, Banner, I'd respond to your dialogue, but I'm mostly concerned about the fact that you're holding Ferro the Cat, like, right around his throat there. Pra! A little oxygen, if you don't mind. I'm used to choking on hairballs, but this is too much. Meow. Alexis says they'll just have to hope that Camula doesn't play Illusion Gate, which of course leads to Camula playing Illusion Gate. Alexis, maybe next time you'll think twice before making allusions to Illusion Gate. Camula reminds us that Illusion Gate first destroys all monsters on the field, and then she can summon any monster Jaden has played. Her Millennium Choker, I mean Shadow Charm, glows, and she mentions all she needs to do to activate Illusion Gate is deliver a soul to the Sacred Beasts if she should happen to lose. She ponders over which of Jaden's friends to sacrifice, and then she just decides to put all of their souls at stake. Oh, I see the Shadow Charms operate on Yu-Gi-Oh! Season 1 rules, in that you can just sort of make up rules as you go along, and nobody questions it. With this necklace, I can do anything. Oh yeah, that's definitely Yu-Gi-Oh! Season 1 rules right there. Jaden moves his head back, and the broken medallion around his neck just falls into place, and both pieces connect, fusing together in a brilliant display of magical light. What, you didn't try just placing them together yourself? It had to happen by accident. Should just be called Lucky Charms. If only so Night Shroud could have said, they're always trying to take my Lucky Charms. Sorry, these shadow charms are really pissing me off today. Alexis exclaims that Jaden's shadow charm cancelled the power of Camula's necklace, which I don't think he was trying to do because even he seemed shocked by it. And this begs the question, why do the shadow charms cancel each other out randomly like that? If you're part of an evil group trying to overthrow the world or whatever, is it really a good idea for each of you to be carrying the one thing that can stop you all from pulling it off? Seems pretty ass backwards to me. And I'm a guy who likes his asses forwards at all times. Times. Camula cries out in fury while showing off a lot of leg, and Jaden thinks to himself, Thanks, Atticus. Couldn't have done it without you. Even though you literally and figuratively did. No, you're right. If Atticus hadn't been abducted and then was brainwashed into serving an evil entity and then lost to you in a card game and fell unconscious so that you could take his stuff, you never would have pulled this off. Thank you, Atticus, for intentionally doing all of those things. Jaden tells Camula to put that cheating card away and get on with this duel, which is is rich seeing as how Jaden apparently has upwards of 30 different fusion monsters at his fingertips at any given moment. Camula is forced to offer her own soul as sacrifice in order to use Illusion Gate's effect, laying waste to elemental hero Tempest's crutch and resurrecting it on her side of the field. Camula then summons Zombie Werewolf in attack mode. Nice of the Lycans to get over their pesky centuries-long grudge against vampires so that Camula can play with them in a children's card game. And then Camula attacks with elemental hero Tempest. Jaden's life points drop to 1200, and Camula is about to follow up with Zombie Werewolf, but then Elemental Hero Tempest's crutch begins to disobey Camula. Jaden explains, Guess he doesn't like his new boss. But you can forget the two-week notice! Yeah, Camula shouldn't be so surprised he wasn't looking for a long-term position. After all, you can't spell Elemental Hero Tempest without temp. Turns out Jaden activated his trap card, Crossheart, which puts Elemental Hero Tempest back on Jaden's side of the field. Im is Chaz pressed and comments that Jaden's learned a few new tricks, and we see the Crowler doll sticking out of his pocket, chiming in with a, I hope so. Imagine having your soul taken out of your regular human body and put into something so small and cute. I personally would refrain from going out in public. Can't imagine. Jaden says that he's going to teach that werewolf pooch a few new tricks, which is coming right off of Chaz's line about Jaden learning new tricks. So it's driving the writer in me nuts. Seriously, these lines are practically adjacent. Looks like Jaden's learned a few new tricks. Time to teach that werewolf pooch a few new tricks. Sounds like the writer could learn a few new tricks like checking a thesaurus once in a while. Jaden says he's gonna teach them how to play dead, and then Tempest destroys Zombie Werewolf. I personally would not trust Jaden alone with my pets. Not after seeing this. Hey, do you reckon if Zombie Werewolf joined Duel Academy, they'd be assigned to Old Ra Yella? Yeah? Cause dead dogs. Camula's life points drop to 2400, but now she's able to summon another zombie werewolf from her deck with an additional 500 attack points. Jaden then delivers this totally natural read. Maybe a face down will tame him. Maybe a second take would have saved that line. Camula has a brief in a monologue and then makes one of the strangest card drawing effort noises that I've ever heard. And I've heard a lot because I watch Yu-Gi-Oh. You have much more to worry about than just him. This next turn should prove that. Blah.
It sounds like she pulled the card out of herself. Camula plays Pot of Greed. This allows her to draw two more cards, which I assume means she makes this noise. Bah, bah. Sounds painful. Camula asks, Do you know the only thing worse than a vampire mistress? Getting caught cheating with them by your werewolf wife? A vampire mistress with a grudge. Oh sh! she's gonna summon the grudge? Quick Jaden, activate your cursed VHS tape trap card. Get your Ringu on, it's the only way. Camula brings out Vampire Genesis. Speaking of which, Cyrus and Chumley discuss Terminator Genesis. Did you see that? Unfortunately. Bastion says Jaden will have his work cut out for him. This makes Bastion think of all the schoolwork he could be doing right now, and he gets all moody, but in a posh kind of way. Camula activates Genesis Crisis, which is basically the plot of the video game Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, letting her draw a zombie monster to her hand every turn, and then discard it using Vampire Genesis to summon another low-level zombie monster. And I bet you're thinking she's gonna use this elaborate summoning method to summon something really cool, aren't you? Nope, zombie werewolf, just the same thing as before. She has a full-on harem of werewolves at this point. Or is that a howlum? You know, I think I might be a zombie werewolf myself. After all, I have a very strong urge to howl at Camula's full moon. Camula seems to already know how Jaden's elemental heroes work, and prevents him from using Tempest's ability by removing his trap card from the field using her giant trunade. Cyrus wonders how she could possibly know all that. How did she know to do that? I don't know. I mean, to be fair, you guys are always screaming at the top of your lungs what your cards all do. It's not like it's this big secret. You tell literally everyone in earshot. Even Jaden is curious. So isn't the villain supposed to tell the charming hero how she did it? Cause I'm all ears. By that logic, isn't the charming hero supposed to be charming? It's right there in the description. Even the shadow charms are more charming than you, and they're shit. Camula's eyes glow bright red. Looks like she really did get her game on high. And she reveals that her bats aren't just for decoration. They were spying on each and every one of you. God, can you imagine how bored the bat spying on Bastion must have been? Day two. He's still studying attack point quantum mechanics. Every five minutes or so, he'll just let out a loud chuckle and say the word remarkable and then go back to doing it. That bat must have been miserable. And just as they told me the weaknesses of your pathetic little friends, Crowler and Zane, they told me yours. The bat spying on Crowler must have come back with a very long list of weaknesses. Okay, so really, literally anything will throw this guy into a state of despair. Just say something mildly rude about his haircut. Call him professor instead of doctor. That really, it, he hates that. Oh, and try taping over his copy of Beaches, the movie. That would break him. Vampire Genesis's crotch proves too strong for elemental hero Tempest. And Chumley explains, This is very anti-licious. Add it to the... Wait, no. Remove it from the list? Camula commands Zombie Werewolf to attack directly, and then is shocked as Jaden refuses to fall down, claiming he should have no more life points left. How is this? Insurance is how! Oh, Jaden actually went out and bought life point insurance. Probably a wise investment given how many he goes through. Turns out that Jaden somehow knew that Camula would know how his deck worked, and he planted that trap card so that Camula would send it back to his hand, activating its effect and giving him 500 extra life points. Wait, so hang on, when Camula knows how Jaden's deck works, it requires a lengthy explanation and nobody understands how it's possible. But when Jaden just magically knows Camula's strategy, there's no explanation necessary? How do we know Jaden isn't spying on everybody with his own army of winged Karibos? And before you go getting any ideas, notice I have no wings. I can assure you that I am not one of Jaden's army of Karibos here to spy on you. Just a messenger for the Dark Lord Zork, that's all. The others begin to panic, worrying that Jaden isn't on top of his game here, and they might have to offer their spirit keys up to Camula after all. Let's bargain with her. Maybe put her in touch with the local blood bank. Ah yes, not only is there a Taco Bell on Academy Island, there's also a handy blood bank. Check the map, I'm not lying. I think this is bigger than that, Professor. I mean, sure, vampires crave blood, but I think this one craves our spirit keys a lot more. You'd think draining someone of their blood would be a much quicker way to go about taking a key from someone versus playing a long drawn out card game. But hey, I don't make the vampire rules. Camula starts having a flashback, and it's told in like a ye olde storybook form. Can't wait to hear about how they played ye olde children's card games back in ye olde times. We lived in harmony with our mortal brothers and sisters. Yes, nothing says living in harmony quite like building a massive f**k off castle towering high over the human village. Oh, we misheard the phrase harmony. We thought that you said harm own ye, and assumed that's what we were supposed to do. 
Harm and own ye. I'm a vampire Karibo now. Blah. That is until the dark times. Until the war. Look at that half-naked vampire with a ponytail. He's definitely dressed for war. Also, wait, hold up. Can we take a moment to digest this? Yu-Gi-Oh! GX has now introduced to Yu-Gi-Oh! Canon that humans and vampires once went to war with one another. I just want that to sink in because I feel it might get lost somewhere amongst all the cyborg monkeys and golden egg witches. Neither soldier nor child was spared the horror as hatred decimated both our peoples. I'm gonna guess that killing and slaughtering was what was decimating them for the most part, but sure, hatred. That's a nice TV appropriate way of putting it. Camula explains that she is the last of her race and she had to go into hiding. Then she was approached by a stranger who offered her the choice of staying in her tomb or joining him in his quest to seek out the sacred beast cards. And really, who wouldn't put aside a centuries old grudge against the human race and risk vampires being made extinct for a few cool trading cards? I know I would, and I've had a grudge against humans for ages. Camula says that for each duelist she defeats, their souls will be hers, and she will use these souls to resurrect her army of vampires. You've gotta feel bad though for whatever vampire ends up with Zane's soul. Even for the undead, he was particularly deadpan. Camula goes all out for the climax of her story. And we would suck our revenge from the bloated vein of humanity! Got a real Bella Lugosi from Bride of the Monster vibe from her there. She tampered in God's domain. I for one would absolutely let Camula suck the revenge out of me for the record. Wow, a little too much information there. Oh, like you wouldn't be first in line, Jaden. Jaden isn't lacking confidence. Or puns. Lady, if you think that I'm gonna give up, you really have gone fatty. Jaden activates Pot of Greed. Is this the only duel I've seen where both players use Pot of Greed? I think it might be. And he plays the Amazon.com card. I play Dark Factory of Mass Production! Jaden activates a gate of his own, Fusion Gate. I haven't seen this many gates since I went to the Gate Museum and I had to open a gate to go in there. And I stayed at the Watergate Hotel while I was there. And the guest speaker was Bill Gates. I'm gonna stop now. And then he fusion summons Elemental Hero Flame Wingman. But wait, he doesn't stop there. He then fuses Elemental Hero Flame Wingman with Sparkman to summon... Elemental Hero Shining Flare Wingman! Wow! And of course Camula is shocked by this because I guess Jaden was keeping this card hidden in a special bat-proof briefcase under his bed or something? But you've never used that card in your deck before! Yeah, welcome to Yu-Gi-Oh! Protagonist Powers, baby! The card didn't even have to exist, let alone be in his deck, and Jaden could have summoned it. Camula says, You put it in there when I wasn't looking, didn't you? It's taking all of my Karibo strength to not make a sex joke about that. Come on, Karibo strength. Don't let me down. Come on, Kari. That's what she said. Damn it. Jaden pimps out his new monster. And boy, is he. Check out that glow. I honestly thought he said, big boy, isn't he? And really, that could apply to any number of Jaden's monsters. The guy has a type, that's all I'll say. Jaden explains how Shining Flare Wingman will overcome Vampire Genesis despite having less attack points. Because for each of my elemental heroes that are just chilling away back at the graveyard, Jaden, they're dead. They're not chilling out anywhere. Is that what your parents told you when your family pet died? That it's chilling out in the graveyard. Jaden's concept of death needs some uh, fine tuning, let's say. With two elemental heroes in the graveyard, not chilling, just dead. Jaden's Shining Flare Wingman gains 600 attack, raising it to 3100. This gives it enough attack points to overcome Vampire Genesis, and Jaden calls out the attack. Show this lady how we do things back at Duel Academy. Oh, you mean fall asleep? in class and risk failing school multiple times in the same month? Or maybe getting abducted because the school faculty doesn't care about your safety? Which aspect of Duel Academy life are you asking Shining Flare Wingman to emulate exactly, Jaden? Elemental hero Shining Flare Wingman attacks with Solar Flare, and as a result of Vampire Genesis's demise, all of Camula's monsters are destroyed. Jaden then explains that Shining Flare Wingman's special ability causes Camula to lose life points equal to the attack of the monster he just destroyed. This drops Camula to zero, who rather than assume the standard losing a card game position, instead opts to sort of kneel down gracefully. Presumably because the image of Camula on all fours would not be nice or TV appropriate. Jaden, having now wiped out the last remaining vampire in existence, comments on the gravity of this moment with level-headed composure and respect. That's game! Or he just celebrates winning a card game.
I mean, that's clearly the most important thing here. Illusion Gate then manifests behind Camula, a spectral hand reaching out and plucking the very soul from her body before disappearing once more. Camula herself disintegrates in a puff of sexy magic, leaving behind her Millennium Sorry her Shadow Charm, and her Zane Sackboy. Jaden is, again, rightfully concerned about the fact that he just wiped a race of people off the face of the planet. Look, it's Zane's doll! Or he's just excited to see the doll version of a guy that he knows. Again, I guess that's the most relevant thing to mention out of everything that's just transpired. Zane's doll glows with a purple ethereal energy and is replaced by the real Zane. Though it would have been funny and totally believable if nobody noticed the difference. Baff is chazzled as Dr. Crowler also transforms back to his usual self, and then they all rush to the exits as the castle begins to crumble to pieces. Everyone watches from the shoreline as the castle collapses in on itself, each of them racked with the terror of the eldritch horrors they narrowly survived. All of them, that is, except for Jaden, who simply watches with a blank expression as the ancient force he destroyed sinks into the depths below. You know, that Jaden kid is holding on to a lot of f***ed up shit inside of that head of his. It's gotta register eventually, right? The dark clouds disappear appear and the sun comes out once again, and then we see Atticus lying in his hospital bed, thinking of Jaden. Jaden, you did it. Yes, from now on, whenever the cast of GX sees a sunrise, they will think of Jaden and thank him for sparing them from being slaughtered by vampires. And I think we should all start doing this as well, in real life. Thank you, Jaden, for protecting us from the Hooded Claw and keeping the vampires from our door. Jaden and his friends, and Bastion, look out onto Academy Island, and Alexis comments, At last, the nightmare is finally over. Nah, this show has like 150 episodes left. Oh, you mean the vampire thing. Right, yeah, sorry, uh, phew. Bastion. Ooh. Hands Camula's shadow charm to Jaden, because obviously he's proven to be the most responsible and trustworthy with dangerous magical artifacts, and definitely isn't a punk kid who would trade them all for a new elemental hero card. Jaden comments that more shadow riders will be on the way, and then we pan up to see the sun shining brightly overhead. So please join me in thanking Jaden Yuki, our lord and savior, for protecting us from the armies of vampires that seek to drain our fleshy bodies of the sweet blood nectar within. Thank you, Jaden. If it weren't for you, we'd all be sleeping in coffins and dressing in sexy, revealing outfits. What a guy. And that's the end of the uh, trilogy of terrifying Camula episodes, which is a real shame, I'm gonna be honest, if I, if I, uh, if you want my actual opinion of this episode and the episodes, uh, that Camula featured in, I really enjoyed them. I really enjoyed, uh, getting to know Camula, the Shadow Rider. She was a very entertaining and different villain, especially for Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, she was funny, she was scary, she was sexy, she just, she had just about everything. And she felt like a real threat, she felt, she felt like she was actually, uh, she could have taken out all of the duelists herself. It, it really, uh, I wasn't really feeling Night Shroud because Jaden took him out in one fell swoop, practically, and he had to take a bunch of hostages, whereas Camula was just willing to just, uh, one by one, like, take all their souls, and it was, uh, she seemed to be doing a good job of it up until, uh, this episode. And I think one thing Yu-Gi-Oh! GX has been missing has been, uh, an entertaining foil or villain character of sorts, because I really, uh, I'm not a big fan of, like, uh, Zane as he is right now, and I don't think he's really much of an antagonist yet, but, uh, I know he becomes one. Uh, and Crowler is obviously a very goofy antagonist, uh, it's just, it, uh, until, like, this, until this little storyline, there really hasn't felt like there's been a decent enemy to be contending with, and, uh, Camula really fit the bill, I thought. And I get the feeling that she's just not gonna come back, which, uh, I, I assume is the truth, because I, I feel like people have said that to me before, and if that's it for Camula, I think it's a real shame. I think, I think she could've, uh, she could've stuck around at least for another arc or something. Which is to say nothing of the fact that Yu-Gi-Oh! GX just, uh, casually usually dropped the fact that vampires exist in the Yu-Gi-Oh! world, and then, with this episode, kind of undid that. They kind of just were like, well, there's vampires, but she's the last one, and she's gone. So no more of that. No more vampires, no more interesting supernatural stuff going on here. I... I'm not- I'm not too thrilled about losing Camula and the whole vampire subplot, which wasn't really a subplot. It was barely a, a sub, let alone a plot, but, uh... I, I, I was interested. I'm way more interested in the vampires and the war with the humans from centuries ago 
than I am about any of these sacred beasts, if I'm being honest. So I'm, I, I'm probably sound like I'm complaining about the episode and saying that it was bad. It wasn't bad. I'm just sad that they got rid of a, what I thought was a very interesting little plot thread that could have been explored at a later date. But who knows, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they bring Camula and vampires and all that back. Maybe all of it comes to fruition much later down the line and I'm just not aware of it. I think it's a bit of a cop-out to have Jaden defeat the second Shadow Rider as well as the first one. Like, I get it. Yeah, he's the main character. Yeah, he's the hero. Yeah, he can be anybody if he puts his, his mind to it and his heart in his cards. But could have given that to somebody else. Didn't have to be Crowler or Zane, but I mean, I'd even accept Bastion doing it. <laughs> I say that, but I'm questioning it as I say it. Still not sure how I feel about the Shadow Charms. They feel like they're easily exploited and kind of broken, but... It wouldn't be Yu-Gi-Oh if things weren't easily exploited and also broken. So yeah, it's, it's very fitting for Yu-Gi-Oh, but I feel like, uh... I'm gonna be honest, the Millennium items are cool, but I only really like a couple of them. <laughs> I only really like a couple of Millennium items, so these Shadow Charms just kind of feel redundant to me. Am I the only one that thinks that are Shadow Charms? Do you guys like the Shadow Charms? I hope not, because I think they're quite rubbish. <laughs> but who knows, maybe they'll come around, maybe I'll come around to the Shadow Charm. Mostly I was just, hey, a cool vampire lady, and now she's gone. Sad. Sad about that. But yeah, that's the end of episode 33 of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, also known as Field of Screams Part 3, the uh, third in the trilogy of Camula episodes. And Kor, what a popping trilogy she had. I think overall it lent a lot to the show. It, it really fleshed out uh, Crowler. It gave Zane a little bit of a character moment. And uh, then it showed you uh, why Jaden is the most OP uh, motherfucker in the uh, Academy. And what more do you need? So yeah, I liked the episode within the context of the trilogy of Camula episodes, but this episode by itself was not that remarkable. Outside of introducing the vampire lore, which they then immediately scrubbed out, so. I'm not a fan of that call, but meh. But I can't end the video without giving a very important and whopping big thank you to all of our Patreon pledges. All of our patrons, thank you so much. This little Karibo would not be able to do half the things that he does without all of you. So thank you so much. My cute little fluffy hands are waving in celebration of all of you. Thank you. They're not fluffy hands. They're claws. There's no fluff on them. But they're waving regardless. Thank you so I'm getting myself in a bit of a tizzy just uh, thanking all of you, but that's how much I want to thank you. Thank you so much to all of our patrons. You guys, thank you so much. You guys keep us going, and thank you. And it's not just the Dark Lord Zork who has given me the magic necessary to become a little purple Karibo man floating around your screen. It's also my good friend Lady Nanaki who uh, came up with the concept art for this Karibo model and also uh, the talented artist at Bunchata, B-U-N-C-H-A-T-A, for redesigning and rigging this Karibo model. I would not be able to fly around and flit about without the great talents of Lady Nanaki and Bunchata. Thank you so much to those of, to, to both of you for your incredible artistic skills and rigging. It's been amazing. I wouldn't be able to get my game on high without you guys, so thank you. Well, without further ado, I'd better get back to uh, Slifer Red, where I'm uh, sleeping in the corner of the room in a bucket, because they don't have any extra beds, apparently. But I'm going to have to make do and finish my education here at Dual Academy and finish watching the rest of the episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, preferably before my uh, short Karibo lifespan ends. That would be nice. Anyway, <laughs> I'll catch you guys later, and don't forget, Hail Zork. That I will show the world that I can be its master. I will perfect my own race of people. A race of atomic supermen which will conquer the world. And we would suck our revenge from the bloated vein of humanity.